The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. The traditional Easter declaration is being proclaimed today throughout the Western Church. From small chapels and country churches to downtown cathedrals, to prison chapels in village gathering places, beneath camouflage netting near battlefields and in the quiet simplicity of monasteries and convents, the amazing news of Jesus' resurrection is being heralded in word and song. If there is one word that will be heard today more than at any other time, it must surely be, <coughs> Alleluia. And this year, perhaps more than any other year in recent memory, it feels like we have earned Easter. I asked my friend Ron Rhodes to give me some statistics. During this past winter, Evansville had a total of 18 and a half inches of snow, six and a half more than is our norm. The coldest temperature of the winter was a bone chilling seven below in February. This morning on the way to church, you could see budding trees, daffodils, hyacinths, pansies, and green grass. We have moved from winter storm warnings to springtime thunderstorm warnings. We have earned this spring, my friends. We have earned this Easter. But of course, we cannot earn Easter. Easter, like all of God's gifts, comes to us as a gift of grace, a blessing we do not deserve, a sacred endowment from God that cannot be earned or worked for. Easter is like the story of a Yankee who was traveling in the South and ordered breakfast. Along with the breakfast he ordered came a bowl of white pasty stuff. What's that? Grits, says the server. But I didn't order grits. Oh honey, grits just come. <laughs> Easter is like that. We didn't order it. Easter just come. Still, Easter comes with a price. I'm not talking about the cost of your new clothes, though you're a handsome looking bunch from the heights of this perch. I'm not even talking about the little gifts you may have purchased. I'm not even talking about the price tag for brunch or dinner. Easter comes with a price, and too often we forget just how expensive that price truly is. Last Sunday, we were here, whooping and hollering at the parade that welcomed Jesus to Jerusalem. And now this week, we are in here yowling and shouting our hallelujahs. That's the kind of Christianity we like. Celebrations, revelries, joyous times of laughter and happiness. But the truth is that between Hosanna and Alleluia, a man died. The truth is that between the palm branches and the Easter lilies, there stands a cross. The truth is that connecting those two successive Sundays of high-spirited worship, there was a time of tears and sorrow. A man was unjustly tried, condemned, executed, and locked away in a tomb because his message of love and compassion was considered beyond what the culture was willing to accept. In keeping with the age-old practice, to silence the message, you silence the messenger. And that is what we did. Not them. We. We rejected God's message of love. We discarded the idea that loving your neighbor was what God really wanted from us. We considered as unnecessary and superfluous God's way for us, and we took matters into our own hands, telling God exactly what we thought of God's will and way by killing the one sent to proclaim it and demonstrate it. God sent Jesus to us, and we flung Jesus back in God's face. There was the price that was paid 
for Easter. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb that first Easter morning to do what women have done for hundreds of centuries before and since. She went to mourn one she loved. Her world had come to a shattering end on Friday with the death of Jesus. What, that she had spent the most significant part of her life in his company discovering who she was and who God intended to be, it, it was gone. Arriving at the tomb, she saw that the stone that had served as a door was rolled away. That was all she needed to see. And she ran to the disciples to tell them that the body of Jesus had been stolen. Peter and other disciples, traditionally understood as John, ran to the tomb and found it as Mary Magdalene had told them. And then, wait for it, they went home. But not Mary. She stood at the tomb and wept. It was simply all too much. She wept over the one she loved too much to lose. And as she wept, two strangers spoke to her. She understood them to be angels. And they said to her, why do you weep? They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And then she turned and saw someone she assumed to be the gardener. After a few words with the stranger, Mary heard a voice she recognized speak a word she recognized. Mary, he said her name. This was no gardener. This was Jesus. And Mary went and told the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Mary went that morning to mourn a dead friend. What she received was all the proof she needed that this was not an ending, but a beginning. Mary encountered the living presence of the living Christ, and her life was never, ever the same. That was the price Mary Magdalene paid for Easter. And we pay a price for Easter. When we are being honest with ourselves, we find ourselves in that story. We see our participation in the execution and death of Jesus Christ. We find ourselves approaching the tomb, ready to grieve, and then caught up in a whirlwind of emotion and feelings that cause us no small measure of confusion, discomfort, and bewilderment. We hear the Easter story and we are caught in a quandary. Will we believe or will we have doubts? Will we embrace the possibility of a new beginning to our lives? Or will we relegate this ancient story to the realm of fairy tale and let it wash over us, changing nothing? Will we listen for Jesus to call our name? Or will we slip into this place on Easter morning, sing an alleluia or two, and then go back out as if nothing at all has changed? You see, my friends, when we come face to face with the story of Easter, whether we approach it literally or metaphorically, we cannot remain unchanged. When we consider the possibility that God is really willing and completely able to forgive whatever needs forgiving in our lives, taking away the pointless existence of the past and replacing it with a meaningful and authentic life, we simply cannot pass that by. When we understand that the grace of God that makes Easter possible in the first place is the same grace that is being poured into our lives and ushering in a new beginning filled with untold possibilities and unimaginable potential. Don't we want to claim that for ourselves? That is the price we pay for Easter. If the Easter story is real, and if it means what our faith claims it means, 
then it means that with the Apostle Paul, we can say Christ died for our sins, as the scriptures say. He was buried, and three days later, he was raised to life, as the scriptures say. Christ appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, and after this, he appeared to more than 500 other followers. Most of them are still alive, but some have died. He also appeared to James, and then to all of the apostles, and then finally, he appeared to me. Finally, he appeared to me. And nothing has ever been the same. Christ is risen. Nothing is the same. We are not the same, thank God. But that's the price you pay for Easter. Amen.